these basic, uh, more straightforward concepts to some mathematical concepts, okay? What I would recommend, again, is to bring a pencil, and I'll provide you with some paper so you guys can write out any calculations. Of course, this is going to be through um, OWL, so the typing in the answer is very important, okay? That's the problem, okay? You only have one shot at it. So we're going to we're going to do it. Just I think you guys are pretty good at typing in OWL answers by now, okay? And we'll see how it works out, okay? I think it'll be okay, though, so don't worry. Don't worry too much about it. And if there's a massive problem this time, we'll think of something a little bit different for next time, okay? But I, prom I promise you it'll all work, okay? Any questions? No questions? Okay, cool. Um, Of course, but 
different mass numbers and they're the same element. Okay? Um, okay, so uh, we've been over uh, this type of nomenclature before. Remember, uh, Z down here is the atomic number. The mass number is up in the top left corner. The symbol of the atom is the big thing in the middle. And then the charge of the particle, which we haven't really gone over, but maybe uh, if we get to it in the next chapter, we'll talk about what are known as ions. Ions, and they're actually atoms with a charge that's located in that position. So this is the way you would write it, like if you were writing it on a piece of paper or something. Yeah. Um, again, if you wanted to write uh, um, boron 11, the 11 in the top left corner, B as the symbol of the element, not showing the atomic number because the atomic number and the elemental symbol, of course, uh, contain redundant information. Okay. And notice boron 11, when we show it that way, is uncharged because it doesn't have anything up there. Um, and then you can know by the atomic number, the number of protons, the number of neutrons, and uh, the particular element. And notice here, We've got two isotopes of boron, one boron 11, one boron 12, um, both of them having different uh, amounts of neutrons, but the same amount of protons. Okay, so is everybody clear on isotopes and everything like that? Okay, so let's talk about relative masses. And I know everybody was uh, very frustrated maybe with calculating, you know, the distance or the difference. I'm sorry, converting like miles to kilometers or uh, certain values like that because uh, on the surface they really don't have very much to do or very very much in common uh, with your thinking about what chemistry would be. Okay, And we really start you to do those calculations with those types of figures is because you're very you're more familiar with those types of numbers and units than you are with the units that you actually um, need to use on a more common basis in uh, chemical analysis, okay? But the thing is, is when you uh, get used to doing those types of calculations that we did in chapter one, they really do help you along with the types of calculations that you'll be able to uh, be doing or that you'll be required to be doing uh, through chemical analysis, okay? Um, so actually what happens of how to uh, do these new problems, okay? So the new problems are, if you do them exactly the same as the old problems, they just have different units, okay? And those units might be a little more confusing because we're not used to them as well, okay? And the first one we're going to talk about, one of those units, is the mole, okay? So let's talk about relative masses, first of all, and learn why we need to come up with a new unit called the mole to help us describe the way that atoms are um, counted, okay? So the extremely small size of atoms and molecules, so of course we can't see them, they're, so they're unlike things that we're normally used to dealing with on an everyday basis, okay? So they're very small. So it makes them inconvenient uh, to use their actual masses for measurements. Of course, their actual masses are on the order of 10 to the negative 24th and 10 to the negative 26th grams. So those are extremely, extremely small numbers. In fact, we don't have really any relative basis on how to uh, measure that or to ask ourselves, well, you know, well, how big really is that, okay? So we really need to come up with a different sort of thinking about it so we can start to say, okay, yeah, I kind of am understanding how the magnitude of the mass of these types of things, okay? So, um, uh, yeah, so it makes it inconvenient to use their actual masses for these measurements or calculations, so we use relative mass. So we're actually going to compare the atoms to each other, okay? And we're going to come up with a new unit called the AMU, or you might see it as U, okay? It's the same thing. So relative masses are comparisons of the actual masses to each other, for example, if an object had twice the mass of an o another object, their relative masses would be 2 to 1. Okay, does that make sense? 2 to 1 if 
some, something is twice as heavier as something else. So the relative mass scale, uh, the unit that we use is this atomic mass unit, or the AMU, and it's defined as one twelfth of the mass of a carbon twelve atom. Okay, so a carbon twelve atom is exactly twelve point zero 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 AMU to infinity. So twelve point zero zero whatever AMU. So one twelfth of that would be one AMU. So that's the official definition of one AMU. But one AMU can be thought of to represent the mass of either one proton or one neutron, okay? So, uh, hydrogen, uh, hydrogen one has one proton and its mass is one AMU. Uh, helium two would have, um, or helium four would have two protons and two neutrons, uh, the mass being four point oh oh Okay, and then, so if you could look, yeah, again, a, an atom with a mass equal to twice the mass of carbon, 12, would have a relative mass of 24 AMU, so that would be like magnesium 24. And then there's this conversion factor here that really converts um, AMUs to grams. So this is something that uh, you should uh, try to remember but I'll give you this uh, conversion on any sort of test, okay? Because, I mean, I want you to understand more of the concept instead of memorizing all these numbers and conversions, okay? But it is good to kind of remember this number because it gives you an actual idea of how small these, act these things actually are. Okay, so I'll give you this calculation, but let's try to use this calculation in a problem. So let's try to figure out how many grams, I don't know, one uh, vandium 51 atom weighs, okay? So vandium 51, like that, right, let's draw the whole chemical symbol. Okay, so if I were to ask you what's the mass of vandium 51 atom in AMUs, you would tell me what? Who would tell me what's the right answer? It's 51 AMUs, right? So, because it's got uh, 23 protons, right? And then it would be 28 neutrons, right? So, 20, 23 protons and 28 neutrons. That gives me a mass number of 51, okay? And remember we said this mass number is the total number of protons and neutrons, and each proton and each neutron weighs how many AMU? Each. One, right? One AMU each. So the total mass of a vandium-51 atom in AMUs would be 51 AMU. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So we go 51 AMU. So we were wondering, we could even go so far as to say per one vandium 51 atom, if we wanted to go so far, okay, and use that as another unit. And remember, we wanted to say, well, how many grams does one vandium atom weigh? So how will we do that? Well, we just use our conversion factor that we have up there and say, well, multiply that by, well, one AMU equals 1.6 Everybody see how I did that? It makes sense, right? So then AMUs, of course, will cancel out. And now we have units of grams per one and vanadium 51 atom. And that's what we were really looking for, right? So we can say, well, I can't do that calculation in my head. So we got 51 times 1.661. Okay, and 
relative to this piece of chalk is like nothing, you know? And this piece of chalk in my hand is like nothing, you know? So you can imagine. I don't know how familiar you guys are with holding pieces of chalk, but it's not very good. So what if, I mean, how many vanadium atoms do we have to get to have one gram in our hand, which is even less than probably this piece of chalk? That'd be a lot, right? A lot of um, vanadium atoms. And in fact, some other guy, I might be jumping ahead here, but some other guy figured out, his name was Avogadro, he used Avogadro's number. Has everybody heard of Avogadro's number? He used this number to figure out, to say, well, you know, I can figure out how many atoms we need to get the exact atomic weight of each of those atoms. And it's always the same number. Okay, it's actually 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. That's a very large amount of atoms, okay? So Avogadro's number, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. And he labeled this number, in fact, it just doesn't have to be atoms. It can be anything. It can be people. It can be pieces of chalk. You know, it could be anything, okay? So this is just uh, another unit. So this would be, this is now known as the mole, okay? One mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd whatever, okay? Like donut would be a mole of donut, okay? Or atoms would be a mole of atoms. Just like if we had a dozen atoms, it would be 12 atoms. Okay, so this is just a number, just like a dozen is a number, or a baker's dozen is a different number, or a pair is a different number, okay? Or, I don't know, if you guys can think of another number type unit, right? So one mole, mole is just a number, and that number is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, okay? In this case, we're going to look at it as a mole of vanadium 51 atoms. Let's do that, okay? And we'll see how much a mole of vanadium 51 atoms actually weighs. Okay. okay, and we'll see if it weighs something that we can finally get our head around, some number that we can get our head around. So we know that one vanadium 51 atom weighs 8.5 times 10 to the negative 23rd grams. So we'll just use that and this conversion factor to figure out, well, how many uh, grams does one mole of vanadium weigh? Okay. So just use that number, 8.5 times 10 to the negative 23 grams per one vanadium 51 atom. Multiply that by 12. Atoms to moles, so we want to know grams per mole. Okay. So we'll say one mole, and if we want to cancel out vanadium atoms, right? So we say 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd vanadium 51 atoms, like that, and then we see that cancels with that. Everybody see that? Canceling. And now we've got how many grams per mole of these atoms we've got. We could even say mole of vanadium atoms if we really wanted. Okay, so let's do that. Multiply that other number times 22. And what number did we get? Well, I got 51.101, you know, so it all depends on what number uh, you rounded at before. But it doesn't matter. The main point, because we're going to only take it to two significant digits, right, is going to be this 51. And notice, so it'd be 51 grams per one mole of vanadium atoms. Notice, what's the similarity between this number and the original number up there? 51 AMU, they're the same number, 
right? But they have different units. And in fact, what Avogadro figured out is that if you multiply the mass by this number of atoms, you'll always get the atomic mass in the units grams per mole. Okay, so you can kind of do a shortcut here. And if you ask, well, how many uh, grams does one mole of mercury weigh, right, you can say 200.59. You can just write that number off of the periodic table. Okay, um, I suggest that you go through a few of these calculations on your own, okay, but this is what it means to use uh, the units mole. Okay, mole is just like uh, any other unit, like a dozen or a pair or something like that. It's just describing a number. Okay, it's not describing anything else in that. But it is a useful number because it allows you to say the mass number of the, the atom that I'm looking at is equal, we can set it equal to the molecular weight, okay, which is grams per mole. And we can use this. This is much more useful of a term to use than this is up here because we measure in the lab things on the gram scale and not on the AME scale. Does that make sense? Okay, so it kind of helps us say, okay, if I weigh, you know, 83 grams of vanadium, how many actual atoms do I have? So I don't have to go back and say per 51 AMU. Okay, so it really does help you. And right now it might seem like a lot of excess work, but in the end, it'll help you a lot, okay? So make sure you know how to do it. Okay, so I kind of skipped probably way ahead and did this whole problem, but let's just go over all that stuff that we just talked about, okay? So atomic <coughs> weight, that's the mass or the number that you see at the bottom of each of these symbols on the periodic table. That's the atomic weight. And that's the weighted average of the masses of all the isotopes of an element based on natural abundance. I'll, I'm not gonna go too heavy into figuring out the average atomic weight. I think I put maybe some owl, pro owl problems, but on the test, don't worry too much about it, okay? Not figuring it out, but knowing what it is is very important, okay, and knowing what it means. So a weighted average is the average corrected by the relative amounts of each isotope. So uh, fluorine, of course, we know has two isotopes. One is fluorine 35, one is fluorine 37. And notice the average atomic weight of fluorine is 35.4527. So it's somewhere in between 35 and 37. On the side of 35, because there's more fluorine 35 than there is fluorine 37. Again, look at this here. And you can figure it out, because it happens in a three to one ratio, you can figure it out by doing this calculation here. Converting uh, the percentages that you get to a decimal, and then multiplying by the relative masses. Okay, so if you look at uh, chlorine 35 here, this percentage is 75.77%. So if you divide that by 100%, and you're converting that to a decimal, then all you gotta do is multiply it by its mass in AMU. Okay, and when you do that, you get this number. You do it to the other one as well, and then you add these two numbers together, and that gives you the weighted average. And that gives you that number that you find at the bottom of the periodic table, okay? So you can go through that one. There's another one here. What's the atomic mass of boron? Um, and then you can try it on your own. Uh, what's the atomic mass of uh, nitrogen? Remember, the atomic mass is the weighted average of these things. So you would convert this to a decimal, convert this to a decimal, multiply it by, in this case, 14, in this case, by 15, add those two together, and you should get somewhere around that number. Notice, somewhere around 14, right, from the periodic table. Notice, it says 99.63% of nitrogen-14. And look how close that number is to 14. It's very, very close. Because there's only a tiny bit of nitrogen-15, okay? So um, that tiny bit of nitrogen-15 actually raises the average atomic weight by 0 .00674, if you will, okay? But 
this on your own. If you've got any problems, uh, ask me after class and we can do it together. Uh, molecular weight, of course, um, is the mass of a molecule. You can find the molecular weight by knowing uh, the um, molecular structure of the molecule. So, for example, uh, one that we're very familiar with is water, which is H2O. Okay? So we can figure out what the total mass of a water molecule is by adding the average atomic weight of the atoms that it's composed of. Okay? Just like it says here, the molecular weight of water is 2 times H, because you've got two H's in it, and plus 1 times O which is because you've got one O in it, okay? And then if you add those two together, you get, um, well, the relative weight of hydrogen is 1.0018, okay? A lot of people will put, I'm sorry, 1.008, a lot of people will put, and um, the relative weight of oxygen is 16. You'll find that a lot on periodic tables, so if you combine these together, you'll get uh, 18.02, or the molecular weight of water. Okay? Does that make sense on how to figure out molecular weight? Okay, cool. Okay, so I guess let's try it for carbon disulfide together. And let's, I want to go back to this one. Let's try this one together too. Okay, this nitrogen one. Did anybody get the, the answer to this? And did you get it close to that number up there? Let's try it together. And then we'll try that uh, molecular weight together. <coughs> okay, so the first thing you want to do, remember, is convert that to a decimal. So we take 99, what is it, 99.63%. And then the way to convert that to a decimal is you divide it by 100%. Because the percent is the unit. Okay, so we got to get that out. So when we do that, we get 0 0.9963. Okay, so no unit, notice. And then we'll do the same thing for the other one, which is 0 0.37%. We've got to divide that by 100%. So yep, so we get 0 0.0037. Remember, no unit, okay, because the units cancel here. And then we multiply this by, for the nitrogen 14, we're going to multiply that by 14.00. Remember, if it's 14, the, the O's are infinite. So you can take it to as many significant digits as you want, really, um, if you don't have these numbers over here. So this one you're going to have to take to four significant digits. This one to two. Okay? So watch that. But this one is um, an exact number. So you don't have to worry about the number of uh, significant digits there. So we'll take that, multiply that by 14 AMU, multiply this one by 15 AMU. Um,
for the average mass, but unfortunately this is uh, going to have to go to two significant figures. Well, so two, yeah, two after the decimal. So it's only going to be, it's not going to be enough significant figures to really figure it out. But if we had uh, taken this one, maybe to more significant figures, we could actually see that it was doing something. But um, you can really, it's evident looking at this. Um, let's go ahead and figure out the molecular weight of carbon disulfide. Okay, so carbon disulfide is a uh, colorless liquid, CF2. Um, so what's the atomic weight of carbon? The average atomic weight is what we'll do. 12.01, yeah. Okay, so and remember, it's always going to be dependent on the particular periodic table that you use, because they all um, estimate it differently. For carbon, 12.01 AMU, and sulfur is 32.06, yeah, uh, we'll say, AMU. Okay? So carbon disulfide's molecular formula, CS2, if you don't know how to figure that out yet, eventually you'll be able to figure that out. Um, and all we got to do is say, okay, 1 times 12.01 AMU plus 2 times 32.06 AMU. Okay, they're awesome. Okay, and then we'll multiply those together. Probably, you've already done it. What is it? 76.13, is that right, everyone? Right? Okay, cool. AMU. And that's going to be your answer. Okay, so everybody understands how to do that, right? Okay, cool. You guys are rushing me. <laughs> okay, um, so this is what essentially we did with Vandium 51 quite some time ago. Okay, this time is instead we're doing it with. Um, Fluorine 19. Remember, the first thing we did was ask, well, uh, how or what's the amount of, what's the mass in grams of one vanadium 51 atom? Well, here we've got a calculation that's similar, but instead we're asking what's the mass in grams of one fluorine 19 atom. Okay? So notice here we got fluorine 19, multiply it by that conversion factor that I gave you. What happens? AMU of F cancel out, and we get grams per one fluorine atom. Okay. Um, of course, we don't <coughs> only measure one fluorine atom when we're working in the laboratory. It's almost impossible. Okay. Unless you're, you know, a very, very specialized person. Okay. But in the general chemistry lab, we're never going to be just looking at one atom. Okay. We're going to be looking at a uh, number of atoms, in fact, a very big number of atoms, because one gram, as you saw, was quite a big number of atoms. Okay? So, again, we're going to use this new term known as Avogadro's number, which is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. That is a number you will have to know. Okay? I won't give that to you on a test or anything like that different than that conversion factor, okay, from grams to AMUs. That I will give you, but um, Avogadro's number is one of those things that, I don't know, once you learn it in chemistry class, you should take to your grave or whatever, okay? So everybody should know that for as long as they live, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so um, this new unit is needed to deal with a collection of items that has a such large number the moles, but it's just like saying a dozen of something. It's just a number, okay? So I can have a, a mole of, you know, I don't know, cans of Coke or something like that if I wanted to. And that would be 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd cans of Coke, okay? Or donuts or whatever you want, okay? Um, and remember, when we did that Vandium 51 calculation, when we multiplied it, 
the number of grams per vandium atom times that conversion factor, what did we get? We got uh, 51 grams per one mole of vandium. Remember that? So it always comes out to the same number that you find on the periodic table as uh, the mass number. Okay? So, if you will, um, remember if we look up here at sodium, its average atomic mass is about 22.99. Does everybody see that? And if we multiply uh, that number by 6.0, or the, the mass of one atom of sodium by 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, we'll always get 22.99 grams per mole of sodium. Okay? I know it seems obvious right now. I would recommend that you guys go through this uh, at least a couple of calculation times, okay? And then make sure you kind of embody this sort of concept, okay? Um, and then it will really help you guys out a lot more when you're working in the lab and kind of understanding, you know, the, the actual scale that we're working on, okay? Um, and you can see, of course, a mole of calcium would be 40.08 grams. Look at the average mass there. Um, and a mole of sulfur, 30.07, like you would expect. Um, again, this is that similar calculation that we did with vanadium. And here's a cool picture I like to look at. Um, this is one mole of each of these uh, metals. So that's one mole of copper there. That's one mole of aluminum. Okay. One mole of lead shot there. One mole of sulfur. Um, one mole of chromium, and one mole of magnesium. Okay, so those are all uh, kind of amounts that we would, might be uh, weighing in the lab, or we could say maybe half of that amount, or something like that. That might be uh, an appropriate amount of material to be working with in the lab, as opposed to one atom, you see. Okay, so it makes it very convenient, because this is like right on our kind of hand scale. You know, it's not like a big dump truck of stuff, and it's not, you know, microscopic amounts, okay? It's about our hand scale, okay? Does that make sense? So this is why we use this number. Not to mention the fact that it comes out to be its atomic weight. And then you can apply that same concept to compounds. So you say, okay, well, one mole of water equals 18 point, um, 02 grams of water, 18.02 um, AMU, remember, was the molecular weight of water, okay? So it again is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules, and that equals the molecular weight, okay? So it's the same concept over and over and over, okay? So get familiar with it. It really will help you out immensely to uh, learn this early. Um, there's some more mole quantities. You can see a mole of water is 18, about 18 mils of water. Okay, so not very much, maybe a small swallow of water. Okay, uh, and then so that's a molecule, right? That's not an atom. <coughs> so you can apply that same concept. A mole, mole of sodium chloride is this beaker. It's very uh, it's a large amount of salt, I guess, but not really. It's 58.4 grams. Um, beaker of aspirin here, that's one mole of aspirin, and uh, nickel chloride uh, hexahydrate, that's one mole of that. Um, and you can see, you can imagine, well, what would be the molecular weight of aspirin? Well, it must be 180.2 AMU, right? It must be, because one mole of it weighs 180.2 grams. So embody this concept. I know I've been saying that over and over and over, but I promise you it will help you. Um, and then uh, you can actually do on your own some of these calculations that we did earlier, grams to mole to atom. Um, and then there's some practice calculations for you guys to do, and some more practice calculations. Um, I think we went over every one of how to do every one of these types of things in this lecture today. Okay? So, um, yeah, I guess we'll leave a minute or two early.